idea of trying to pre-think what it is that you want your outcome to be. You can actually think through to the types of tools that we're looking at today. So there's a whole lot of things that you can do in that regard. Uh, the other thing to, uh, to, to consider here, and I'm going to encourage you to do, is to try the creative modes on your camera. It's really easy to set it to the big P and just go shoot, 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 but try and, and don't set it to the little running man or the little flower or the whatever little icons your particular camera has. If you can, get out of those modes and get to some of those cases where you can either choose aperture priority or shutter priority and think about what that'll do for you. A lot of background on this photograph photographically, uh, not a lot of time to go into it, but just think about small depth of fields from small f-stop numbers. Uh, small f-stop numbers are the biggest aperture that you can get. The most light comes in and, and it really um, it really gives you beautifully blurred out backgrounds, when you're, especially when you're doing close-up work. So using those particular modes for using the aperture modes for those cases where you want to control depth of field and then using shutter priority when you want to actually stop motion or blur. I love doing night photography. I do a lot of multi-second uh, to multi-minute sort of exposures, but you know, think about it, think about the different possibilities of what, what it would look like with cars going by on the street at night and you get those streams of light and it's very, very interesting. So to play with that. Lastly, ISO. ISO is your friend because it allows you to uh, many times access different types of shoots that you want to be able to use, uh, but uh, indeed you're going to end up with the higher numbers, you're going to be able to shoot in lower light, you're going to shoot and be able to shoot faster in lower light but you are going to have to deal with more noise just like we had in that that one aquarium scene where you're going to need to be able to apply some digital fil filters to it to make those those uh, those problems go away anyway just encouraging you to give it a try reach out to some different possibilities on the camera side think about what it is that you're going to do and that gives you better work to come into the program with and make more interesting changes so with that, that should get us up about to the point of Q&A. Again, we only have a few minutes left here, but let's um, uh, to, you know, see what we can do there. Remember, there's a free trial available. Also, the email that you received, uh, you should have uh, an offer there that gives you a, a, a great additional value, a very interesting uh, additional piece that you can uh, get access to. So with that, Patty, are you available? I am. I'm right here. Can you hear me? I can hear you well. Hopefully everybody else Excellent. can too. <laughs> we have had a lot of questions during the session, Craig, and uh, I guess I'll start off with this one. Um, is there a sequence that should be followed when you're retouching photos? Well, I think it kind of comes down to what your desire is out of the, out of this, the, the process, and you can make changes in various sequences um, uh, to your liking. So I will, I, I treat it as an open anywhere process myself. Uh, certainly um, higher end processing, you, you want to you, you want to do spe specific types of manipulations earlier in the process, but um, at the at the, at the kind of the level of processing that we're doing on a normal basis here, just go in and adjust away. And if you if you can get the digital noise out of there early, that's a great idea. If you can get some of the the uh, types of changes done um, uh, in 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 higher uh, bit depths, something we didn't talk about today, try to get those changes done at that level before dropping down to a lower bit depth. But um, in, in effect, um, have at it, have fun, and uh, you know, do, the, do what you like. That's the main key. Excellent. Um, the next one is about uh, transferring existing photos. So if someone has photos already on their system in another photo editor, can they transfer that over to uh, PaintShop Pro? You can simply point to the folder and those uh, photos will automatically show up in uh, PaintShop. So they're, they're, it's very easy to use. Uh, just again, go in with the, uh, with, with the tool as we looked at it, uh, specify the folder where they are and uh, away you go. 
All right, excellent. Um, I've had quite a few people actually just asking if uh, there's a way to quickly remove backgrounds. So if you're, uh, you've are you got an image and you don't want the background or you want to change it to something else, is there an easy way to do that? We have multiple tools that uh, allow you to remove backgrounds. The uh, old tried and true method that's been around forever is the idea of doing a big old selection, uh, carefully going pixel by pixel around the object that you are trying to extract from the background, and then uh, effectively erasing the background. We have two other tools in the application that take it to a new level. One is the background eraser tool. It's a, a manual tool that you grab. You basically go around the outline of what it is that you are uh, wanting to erase the background from and it will actually erase the background. So whatever you're pointing to and clicking on, that is what it's going to erase and it'll stop when it finds a hard edge. Uh, that's useful where you have a hard edge uh, around an object. If it's a very soft edge and there's not a lot of contrast, it doesn't work particularly well, but um, it's a lot easier than having to do it manually. The third tool I talk about here is uh, something called the Object Extractor, and that uh, is an automated tool. You basically paint grossly around the edge of your object. If it's got a nice hard edge, if it's got a clean, discernible edge, uh, you can basically uh, take the green brush, paint around the object, fill it with the red brush, that's the piece that you're going to keep in this case, and uh, click process and away it goes. It works in certain situations very well. It works actually quite well with hair, wispy sorts of things, leaves, uh, trees, and that sort of, uh, sort of object. So it, it's pretty powerful in that regard. Again, it doesn't work for everything. It's a big box of tools, lots of different options, and those are three of my favorite for doing background removal. All right, I think we just have a few more minutes left here that I'll just try to get in some of the more popular questions. Quite a few people wanted to know if you were actually um, working with a raw image or a JPEG. Most of the... Oh, sure. Sorry, I was just going to say, maybe you can just explain to them uh, whether or not you can make all those changes to a RAW or a JPEG. So um, I basically philosophically shoot RAW. I Everything I do uh, virtually, if I'm not shooting uh, RAW and JPEG, is I'm shooting RAW. And um, then I will bring those photos back in and, and, uh, and work with them. Today I was showing JPEGs and um, I, I could definitely show you how the RAWs work as well. Key here is that for uh, the RAW files are bigger, they uh, have more information in them, they have exactly what the sensor and the camera saw, they have uh, every camera, basically every camera is unique. Uh, we're right now supporting over 350 different cameras for raw processing and in this particular version of the program we have added something called the Camera Raw Lab. And Camera Raw Lab allows you to take your raw image, load it up, change the white balance on it, brightness, do some of the post uh, some of the processing adjustments uh, right there on screen and then uh, you load it into the editor from, from that point on. The uh, interesting things that we have available are that in the raw format you can make those processing changes with the raw lab. You can then capture and apply those raw changes to other images. We also allow you to uh, go in and make a conversion from uh, all of the uh, the images that you have in raw format to one of the editable formats. So the other side of this is that if I simply want to load up a raw, go through the raw lab to make some changes to it in the in the in the developing process, I can then take it into the full editor and then basically as an RGB image make my changes to that, and then I'm going to save it out as a ping or as a TIFF or as a JPEG, more, more likely a JPEG in that particular case. So just for uh, ease of uh, showing you everything today, I, I did it all in JPEG, but RAW is definitely a big focus of what we've done in this particular version of the program. Okay, <coughs> excuse me. I'll just uh, do this um, last two questions. Can you um, explain what a watermark is? Some people were asking about it, they weren't sure exactly what it was called, and, uh, and if you can do that in PSP. 
Yes, we support uh, watermarking, and uh, there's a bunch of different types of watermarking, but uh, basically.